thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem by Howard Nemiroff, who, whose work has meant a great deal to me. On the third panel, lower left corner, Howard's right there. And um, I would just urge you before you leave here to look him in the eyes. <laughs> because he will definitely look back at you. <laughs> Firelight and Sunlight by Howard Nemirov. Firelight and sunlight, silver pale, streaming with emerald, copper, sapphire, ribbons and rivers, banners, fountains. They rise, they run swiftly away. Now apple logs unlock their sunlight in the many windowed room to meet new sunlight falling in silvered gold through the fern ice forest of the glass whose tropic surface light may pierce if not the eye. O oh, early world, still Daphne of the stubborn wood singing Apollo's song in light. O oh, pulsing constancies of flame, warping a form along the logs, slowly disintegrating face, crackled and etched. So quickly aged, these are the mysteries to see and say and celebrate with words in orders until now reserved. For light is in the language now, carbon and sullen diamond break out of the glossary of the earth in holy signs and scintillations. Release their fiery emblems to renewal's room and morning's room where sun and fire once again phase in the figure of the dance from far beginnings here returned, leapt from the maze at the forest's heart, O moment where the lost is found. I, um, I met Howard Nemirov when Wyatt brought him to see us in graduate school in Johns Hopkins. And um, I know some of you have heard this story before, but uh, Wyatt wanted us to meet Howard in part because he was such a terrific poet, but he also wanted Howard to knock the snot out of us. <laughs> and um, we met in the, in the bell tower room, which I know a number of you here know in, in Baltimore, at Johns Hopkins and Gilman, where we had our class. And Howard chain smoked, what was his brand, Wyatt? Well, I'll tell you, it didn't have a filter, whatever it was. <laughs> and um, he, uh, he came in to, to, to talk about her poems. And um, the first woman, my classmate, read her poem. And she had this sort of affected way that poets have, the sighing and the tilting and all. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and she, she, she read her poem. And, um, and, and here was Howard. He had this snowy white hair, these deep blue eyes. He looked so sweet, sort of like a basset hound. And uh, she read her poem, and he paused, and he looked at her. And he said, and he had this sort of tremble in his voice. And he said, my dear. You could read the phone book and make us weep. And he stopped, and I could feel everybody relax. And then he said, but your poem is just not written in English. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the next guy came up, and he had, uh, he had written a Sestina. He was a Sewanee grad, actually. And, um, went on to write some of the later Hellraiser movies, so he's laughing all the way to the bank. But uh, he, he read his Sestina, and Howard read it, looked at it, and said, and I remember the title, the title of the, um, the poem was Saturday Sentence, and the subject was his girlfriend making him clean out the refrigerator on Saturday. And um, yeah, that's a great, you know, Great Sestina subject. So anyway, <laughs> I think of Joe McCorkle's father, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so he, Howard says, it's, it's a Sestina. It's very charming. It's all one sentence. He says, I've never written a Sestina, and neither have you. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the, 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 the third moment was, was the most instructive pedagogical experience I've ever had in my life. There was a young woman who, as I understand now, is also very quite wealthy, um, a philanthropist. She um, 
had really, really small glasses and a, wore a beret, and you know, you can see where that's all going. And <laughs> she, she, uh, she was sitting next to Howard, who, who you know, was probably holding his cigarette in, in her face the whole time. And <laughs> she read this poem, and, and, um, and, and the line in the poem um, was, the carpet swarmed across the floor. And Howard looked over, well, down at her, and said, I'm, I'm not so sure carpet can swarm. And she, um, she proceeded to explain for about 90 seconds how it could. Mm -hmm. And Howard just looked at her and said, my dear, I am willing to concede this is a masterpiece. Now let's move on, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's impossible to come to Sewanee and not, you know, I, I met Howard Nemirov because of Wyatt, and it's so impossible to come here and not reflect on the many people that I know because of him. And, um, you know, in addition to sort of you know, being a, a, just a beautiful poet, he, he has this gift, and along with Cherie and staff's present and past of making Sewanee a very special place. And um, why it's, why it's, I think one of his great gifts is to bring people together. And um, it is a privilege to be here with all of you. And uh, thanks. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called In Vino Veritas. It's from the Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Translated, it is, um, in, in wine there is truth. Um, I prefer my more cumbersome, self-conscious translation, which is um, when you drink too much, you often say things you wish you hadn't. <laughs> Charles, where is that? Okay, okay, all right. Um, anyway, I'm not saying that, that there's anybody in this room who's experienced that phenomenon in the last 10 days, but I, I know I have, so. In vino veritas. Over sliced apples and a wheel of cheese, pale crescent moons of honeydew, and three plump golden loaves of bread. We lift our glasses, lean them into light, and each of us, as through a jeweler's loop, admires the ruby and balsamic hue. Or something in between garnet and tourmaline distilled into a rich molasses brown. Chocolate, someone muses. Michigan cherries and a kiss of sage. Tobacco and the slightest ghost of clove. There is a lull until the fellow next to me identifies cracked pepper, orange zest, blackberry, and vanilla bean. <laughs> Though not to be outdone, another says these grapes were punished early by the cold and wet then rescued through a long and providential miracle of sun. Who wouldn't want to call to mind a similar heroic year? Or recount with a dreamy look the way one woman does a weekend at this very same chateau, the vintner's ancient St. Bernard, his fetching broken English, and his wife's delectable coquille Saint-Jacques. It gets so boring anymore, listening to others tell you what they know, then somehow having to respond as if you truly cared. And yet, who can afford, in proper company, to say the other things out loud? In the two decades we've been friends, I've never really liked you very much. <laughs> On occasion, I have imagined having sex with Maxwell's wife. Or this, all snowy afternoon, I've been uncomfortably aware that everyone I know will someday die. It's early still. I don't suppose if I slipped out to walk the frozen, quiet quarter mile home that anyone would notice, much less care. But surely I'll discern, I often do, after latching the door and deadbolt lock, a different kind of quiet waiting there. Here, there is laughter, talk of berries ripened on their summer vine, the elemental taste of husky fruit 
mineral and thyme. Two conversations over, I can hear Maxwell's intrepid voice grind on about our taxes and the goddamn poor. When three mole-colored silhouettes appear, two yearlings and a doe, their huge and darkly almond eyes. Half curious, half terrified, they freeze among the cedars looking in. And for the moment, it's enough to even make old Maxwell shut his yap. Three silent creatures on the silent snow, those peach and lightly rose pink evening clouds. And like a fastened antique pin above the cedars, also looking in, a giant pearl apostrophe of moon. Labor Day. Beneath this blunt and dusky colored onion light, flounder glint like wet cobblestones or dismal rainy lakes. Mackerel and amberjack, exasperated cod, salmon, and trout, gill deep in diamond heaps of ice, possess the heirloom sheen of tarnished candlesticks, thimbles, and old unpolished spoons. Yet here and there, far more exquisite alchemies persist. A peacock blue aluminum articulates a basket of sardines. Bronze and copper lusters gild the chub. These freshly fallen nickel pickerel scales seem rinsed in iridescent hues of lavender and jade. His thoughts are otherwhere and far, the monger who relaxes and gazes out into the oyster gray, coin-driven, damp Manhattan day. His drizzle-misted window frames the clownish colors of a fruit and flower stand across Third Avenue, tulip and orange bright, iris and apple, yellow rose and grape. There are no optimists in here, only these jelly-eyed, distracted, sad inhabitants of doubt, mackerel and amberjack, exasperated cod, flounder and disbelieving trout, who, though disgruntled, also seem resigned to these September lukewarm, easy rains and this cool, humid air, a sea-moist, tacky atmosphere in which, like seasonable ghosts, the tastes of longing and departure blend. And you, whoever you may be, might well detect them too. A mild salt breeze, vacated cottages, a padlock clam shack in the closed cafe, those lapping, lightly gasolined green harbor waters at summer's still lonely end. This is a poem about sleep. <laughs> Actually, it's the opposite of sleep, but um, insomnia at 46. Hours like these, we sit here in the satisfying dark. Wind whistles at the chimney cap. A bird's eye maple clock keeps cadence, knock by hollow, polished knock. Though she's been dead 10 years, my mother and I explain ourselves. Together, we admire the blue reversals of the mantel mirror, the cat-like quiet of our street, and her antique mahogany buffet. <clears throat> Hours like these, there seems so much, yet even we both know there is very little left to say. My mother, who was never very young, or happy, or at ease, and I agree. Our history seems ever slight beneath each cold, unshattered, far-flung star. Antares, Castor, Vega, Akamar, that crackles in the midnight sky. I prefer to think I would know how to love her many sorrows better now, and she suspects that's true. Hours like these, the disapproving boy I was still sees her raging inward long debates. Those fixed bewildered eyes and pinch purse lips, the subtle tremor of her head. What were you saying, mother, and to whom? And what, in turn, 
from that strange other room was also being said. <clears throat> this is um, the novelist to his characters with an epigraph from the book of Daniel. All people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive. Relax, grow comfortable inside your skin, take solace, everything will go as planned. The wicked shall impose their will, the innocent shall die, because they must, you know. The cancer death and late affair were both predestined long ago. Your themes, what else, are mortality and love. But all your cruel particulars are mine. The child's stutter, a cousin's palsied hand, one's paralyzing phobia of beards. The twitch, long speculated on, though never quite explained, of great Aunt Esther, widowed in the war. I've labored to perfect your flaws and fears, the secrets, the secret scars that one day will illuminate your greed and inexplicable maliciousness, your thirsts, your predatory skills and calumnies have germinated from a lush ancestral seed, or possibly some prepubescent shame, a playground gaffe, or a bully's prank at your expense, that you will remember mostly when you breathe the smell of cafeteria soups or certain cleansers. Bow down before this troubling dream. Take solace, though, in knowing it will end. Your chief antagonist will spend eternity alone, arrested in the throes of his advancing age, incontinent and frail. He will loiter on that final page and glower out the window on his second floor, surveying fields of snow, the cutleries of ice, bare bodkins gleaming in the February sun. Your names, your names may chime a bell, but mainly he'll recall one August as a boy, first kiss, his uncle's modest clabbered country house, blackberry gathering at dusk. This is his hell, an endless afternoon beside a dying fire, his mug of hot tea steaming just beyond his grasp, an antique hunting rifle mounted on the wall. Pardon and Amnesty. A month ago, ice faceted the willow. Our first forsythia and daffodils were sunned beneath a pellet glaze of sleet. And for a raw few days, the punk of winter fires reclaimed our dismal street. But other flowers now are freshly sunned, flamingo pink azaleas and the rose, a dust of violets blurs the college lawn. And all these creamy dogwoods, having tussled out of bud, enjoy a dry, delicious April flood of greenery and shine. A colleague I despise has brought his freshman class outside. <laughs> Gathered like goslings at his feet, some nod, some pick at grass. Wind flips the unread pages of their books. It's poetry, I overhear him say. The spirit's ancient longing voice, a pure expression of the human soul. He is all hogwash and hot air. But even in the blossom softened trees, the cardinals and the mockingbirds declare it's just that kind of day for saying something generous or grand or at the very least, not small. And Jesus Anderson, what's wrong with that? Besides, his students tend to like him more than yours like you. <laughs> I wonder when that started being true, or rather, when it started meaning less. 
Like velvet white meringues, clouds cruise the stained glass blue Ohio sky. And in the golden post meridian decline of afternoon, groundskeepers weed and mow. To them, we're just two lucky bastards who, take, who teach twice a week, then take the summers off. Surely we must be chums. Fat chance, no shot in hell. And yet, these days it gets more difficult to find reasons to not be kind. The bitchy shrill remarks and self-regard harder to justify. Aprils are fewer now, perhaps that's why. Or maybe that I finally understand silence and letting be are better things. I should be better at them than I am. Mary Jo read that beautiful, terrifying poem about flying the other evening. And um, I thought I would sort of add to that. Um, my wife is terrified of flying. And she would have been terrified by that poem. And appreciative, too. It's quite beautiful. A la belle étoile. I have a flawed French pronunciation, I confess. It, it means, um, in, in a literal way, under the beautiful star and more colloquially, in the open night air. It's late. Even our flight attendants drowse. And 20,000 feet below, Vermont is pillowed safely in snow. Across that dove gray netherworld, a night shift worker navigates her car. Her headlights veering like a ruined star towards several cottages that house mysterious and forbidden lives. What is it that we see out there? We sleepless passengers who stare where the moon and pewter clouds carouse. Or on the starboard isle, who eye those shifting galaxies and nebulae star-dusted far-off Syracuse, Rochester glittering, and Buffalo. Some read detective novels, some the lacquered glamour ads in magazines, while others study lace and fern of frost feathering the plexiglass. Cleveland, Mansfield, then Columbus pass like cities winter deep in fireflies. Oh my good gosh, Millinocket Lake? A woman's gingham voice behind us cries. We used to spend our summers there. I hate to say this, but the world is small, the liver-spotted man beside her sighs. And maybe you can nearly start to see old Millinocket Lake, the family camp where it is always 1963, July and smoky and a little damp. The cabin is tobacco dark inside fishing tackle tangled at its door, sand sprinkled on its thinly varnished floor. All day the oscillating fans blade nick, nick, nicking at its metal cage, grandfather on the dock at his easel, painting the children in their birch canoe. Snapdragon yellow sun, trees beetle green, such North Atlantic rarities in blue. Our destination smolders into view, a phosphorescent cluster on the south. And Millinocket goes the way of each refinery and farm, each tinseled hamlet over which we've blown. Our Boeing dips its wing. We hear the high accelerating whine, the chuck and grumble of the landing gear. Then suddenly, the cosmic and the vast sharpen to particulars at last. Those candelabra, that bright chandelier, the distant cigarette and all, enlarge as through a looking glass, to vacant lot, spotlit salvaged yard, smokestack and Methodist spire. Warehouses ribbed with razor wire are haloed in a carbide glow. Yet even from here, this simple height, this jurisdiction of the common crow, the inexplicable, unjust, and sad seem comfortably nestled among the paisley checkerboard and plaid facade 
of Nashville, Tennessee, where just a little while from now, the clenched young woman sitting next to me will walk the beige and hollow length of her apartment building hall, jangle her copper keys, and formulate the very last thing she should have said, exact and ruthless, to her new ex-lover sleeping soundly in his bed this time of night in ice-bound Montreal, where she would rather be instead. The point on the stairs. Damn it, I should have said that. <laughs> I will not pronounce it in French. <clears throat> the hills, beautiful hills, which is a line from the West Virginia State song. The attic still smells of boredom, sawdust, mothballs, and the rain I climbed up here to watch decades ago as it congealed softly into Sunday snow. I've come again to lose myself among these stale, outdated clothes, bad landscape paintings, a stern dressmaker's dummy and a fox, the rusty eyeless stole that guards it all framed needlepoints, mismatched crutches, a paper sack of agates and postcards, Niagara Falls, Mount Rushmore, and the Hoover Dam, or this one here in which an ice cream Chrysler glides through autumn in New England. The woods are writhing and alive, emphatic with persimmon hues, with mustard, pomegranate, and plum. But in the old Dutch master's boxes, these packs and mackerel and satter fields, and all these silver splashed dements suggest an age of mercury, magnesium, and lead. In living rooms, the color of trout, in low slung kitchens stained with cigarette and iron skillet smoke, on rickety porches looking out across magnetic Appalachian fields my disappointed coy and awkward kin seem always caught, distracted on some lonely lane of thought and bothered into smiling when they would rather not. It's easier to love them now, Aunt Bernadette and her retarded son, our brill-creamed uncle and his second wife, the snowy-headed feeble few whose bedsides reeked of vapor rub and tea and all these tarnished dead I never knew. Canasta players, servicemen, a graduating class of nurses, and this barefooted, nameless girl who walks her nickel-eyed, emaciated hound. Listen, you can nearly hear the moist and muffled static sound of a half-tuned radio, but it's just the rain on the roof that drowns the rowdy laughter down below, the cackle tease and boast of cousins on a raw November day, who, having warmed themselves with wine, will shortly feast on simmered apples, yeast rolls, and a roast. How pleased and mild he looks here, our granddad Claude, relaxing in the old savannah swing in what must be his 66th or 67th year. His days, they say, grew deeper into silence darker into doubt? Was it the child they lost in 17, the two world wars in which he never fought, the heart attack? Was it the prison term that no one ever talks about? His charcoal sweater zippered to the chin, he lets the clear, thin light of early spring rinse over him. Meanwhile, those West Virginia hills behind him roll away diminishing like love or memory or even loss in galvanized percentages of gray. Thorns, thistles. Three starlings jig and sprint, teasing the sprinkler's oscillating spray that pulses like a sterling macrame of water on the lawn. If actuaries are to be believed, barring unforeseen circumstances, I have, roundly, 2,000 Saturdays to live. 
400 waning crescent moons, some 37 more Thanksgiving meals, and nine elections for the president. In the rich blue waxing alp of shade, the gabled roof has laid, the lilies cool, the lilies bruise. Now, by my own accounts, I'd guess almost 12,000 shaves, 6,000 hours more or less of watching televised athletics, and 500 ventures give or take to haul the empty bottles to the dump. In five o'clock's thin light, all multiples of green begin to blur. Mulberry bush, the buckeye, the ivy vines. A nearby power mower winds in Doppler modulation like locust song. It floats this precinct of the middle class with the sweet cut scent of grass, and nothing, nothing now seems wrong. 330 books of stamps. 200 airline flights, 90 dental appointments, seven timing belts, and three more dogs. Two times a year or so, which roughly comes to 70 in all, I'll cry myself to sleep. My, how our silver willows weep. The tulips lift their chalice heads as in a crimson toast. L'chaim, they seem to say, or skull. I have, I'd speculate, 165 of these late day harmonic moments left of iced tea in the Adirondack chair, of pure and undistracted ease until a car horn's blare or the gun crack slamming of a back porch door, the day's commotion coming home at last, 164. Last fall, Billy Collins announced, you may have heard this, that poetry is now post-pastoral. <laughs> and it really pissed me off, because I didn't get the memo. So um, anyway, early autumn in Tennessee. Before October's gold veneer of leaf has covered the chilled creek, and all the trees have grown antique with change, before the wind unveils each rickety and grim physique of maple, poplar, oak, and elm, the cotton downs the dot drying field like strange anachronistic snow. The monarchs come, the monarchs go, but still there are late swallow tails the cloudless sulfurs, too, that glow like incandescent lemon skins. Just yesterday, the evening sky grew gas blue like a pilot light. The meadow purpled into night. And as a flock of grackles came, the black confetti of their flight seemed suddenly to shape a slurred pro... A sl I'm sorry, I'll start over. <clears throat> And as a flock of grackles came, the black confetti of their flight seemed suddenly to shape a slurred, profoundly large and fleeting word against the cool and fragile dusk. At the meadow's far end, I heard the downward spiraling of song. It was a screech owl's shrill reply to what was written on the clear sky. Though really, who could comprehend the meaning of that mournful cry? The air was sweet with soil and hay. Two jet trails hooked a loose crochet across the writhing apple green and flocks blue of the dying day. It was a feeling more than a thought that those cold colors smoldering there seemed like the colors of despair or some unnameable regret. While such forebodings, it is true, will seldom sway the courts of law, or topple legislative chambers. They may give prophets pause or make the brokenhearted exiles weep. And this, for many, is enough. Thank you.